All right. Well, it is uh, 11 a.m. where I am. So good morning to everybody or good afternoon or for some of you, good evening. And, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn Intro to Viral Vectors uh, brought to you by ASGCT Patient Education. Uh, my name is Stephanos Katsukos. I'm, I'm a graduate student in medical genetics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, we, we're delighted to have Dr. Carmen Unsu and Dr. L'Oreal Early joining us today to discuss viral vectors. So our first talk is going to be by Dr. Early, and she'll be discussing what are viral vectors. Uh, Dr. Early has spent over a decade studying biology of AAV, or deno-associated virus, and its use as a vector for gene therapy. She obtained her doctorate from the Oregon Health and Sciences University and completed her postdoc at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Gene Therapy Center. Uh, Dr. Early has been a member of AHGCT since 2012 and is active on both the Patient Outreach Committee and Ethics Committee. Dr. Early is currently a senior scientist at Shape Therapeutics uh, on the product and process development team where she leverages her understanding of AAV biology to create innovative therapies for patients. After Dr. Early's talk, Dr. Carmen Unzu will lead a discussion on safety. Uh, Dr. Unzu has more than 10 years of experience in the gene therapy field. She obtained her PhD from the University of Navarre in Spain, uh, after which she joined the EPFL for a postdoc in Switzerland working on ex vivo liver gene therapy. Uh, three months ago, Dr. Unzu returned to the University of Navarra as a principal investigator, uh, where she works on AAV immunogenicity and explores strategy to improve the safety of AAV viral vectors. So after both of our talks today, we will venture into a moderated Q&A, and I do encourage everybody to please submit your questions to the Q&A box or the chat, whatever is easiest for you. And, uh, and with that being said, I will go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Early to discuss what are viral vectors. Thank you, everybody. Hello, all. I'd like to start by thanking ASGCT for the opportunity to talk about viral vectors and to the audience for joining us today. I'm going to start by describing the delivery challenges of gene therapy and how viral vectors are one of the solutions to that challenge. I think it's important to briefly talk about viruses and how they're manipulated in the laboratory to become viral beneficial viral vectors. I'll describe the three most commonly used viral vectors, the differences between them, and then go over specific examples of types of diseases that each vector might be best for treating. At our last Lunch and Learn, Dr. Tai did an excellent job describing genetic diseases during his introduction to gene therapy talk. But to briefly refresh everyone, genetic diseases are caused by changes in DNA, and these changes can be inside um, genes, which are the DNA instructions for making proteins. If they're in a critical position, then the protein might no longer work properly, or it might not um, be produced at all, or it could gain a new pathological function. To treat these types of diseases, gene therapy approaches need to deliver the genetic material into a patient's cell and sometimes into the nucleus of a cell. And this can be quite challenging, because as you can imagine, our cells have many defenses to try and prevent this from happening. One solution for this is to look to nature, where for millions of years, viruses have evolved to bypass those cellular defenses and deliver their genetic material into human cells. Briefly, I'll mention that there are also non-viral delivery methods, but we won't be discussing those today. Unfortunately, due to the ongoing pandemic, many people are now much more familiar with viruses than they might've been a few years ago. And we all know how effective they can be at infecting people. But really, what is a virus? All viruses have RNA or DNA genomes that are surrounded by a protein shell called a capsid. Sometimes this capsid is a spherical icosahedron like we see for SARS-CoV-2 and for what's pictured here. Other times it can look like a tube, like in the case of Ebola virus. Some viruses have an additional component, which is a lipid membrane that surrounds and protects the capsid. Viruses are often considered parasites because they require a host cell to replicate. When they're outside the cell, they really can't do much on their own, but after they enter a cell and deliver their genomes, they can trick the cellular machinery into making thousands of copies of the virus and turning them into viral factories. Different viruses can infect different types of cells, so a respiratory virus might infect somewhere in the lung or in the throat, whereas other cells might infect the gut or the blood, and this ability to target different cell types is actually advantageous when we're trying to turn them into viral vectors. 
I also think it's important to note that not all viruses cause disease. And there's a virus we'll be talking about later called adeno-associated virus that's been used as a gene therapy vector that on its own isn't known to cause any disease in a person. This is a very simple representation of a viral infection where we have our viral particle, also called a virion, that can infect a cell by crossing the cellular membrane where it will deliver its genome. And once there, the instructions in that genome for making viral proteins will be produced. The proteins can then trick the cellular machinery and turn them into that virus factory, making many, many copies of the virus. These are released from the cell where they can go on to infect a neighboring cell and continue this life cycle. Now that we know what viruses are, what is a viral vector? A viral vector is a virus that has been modified by scientists to become a carrier for therapeutic genetic information. The genes that cause disease from the virus are removed, so the vector is safe and will not cause harm on its own or make the patient receiving the vector sick. For many vectors, but not all, um, some of the viral genes are removed so that they can no longer replicate, and these are called replication incompetent vectors. Once the viral vector genes are, sorry, once the virus genes are removed, uh, there is space for scientists to add new therapeutic genes. And all that's left is this package, this capsid, that allows the viruses to enter the cells. So this way, the viruses can act like a delivery truck or an envelope delivering a good therapeutic payload, much like a Trojan horse, but with uh, a therapeutic gene instead of some angry Greeks. Here we'll discuss some different common types gene therapy approaches. Broadly, these can be classified as in vivo gene therapy or ex vivo gene therapies. In in vivo gene therapy, vectors are de delivered directly to the patient. This can be done through an IV or injected directly into the tissue that's being most affected by the disease. For instance, for neurological disorders, it may be advantageous to directly inject vectors into the brain of a patient where we can target those brain cells that need correction. This is because viruses can have a hard time crossing into the brain from the blood. Another approach might be to directly inject the viruses into the muscle of a patient if they are suffering from muscular dystrophy. For ex vivo gene therapy, we will remove cells from the patient and modify them in a dish in a laboratory. These are done to make permanent changes to the cells that are then grown up in large quantities and infused back into the patient. And we'll talk about some more specific examples of this later on. Because of these different types of approaches, different viral vectors are going to be better for either in vivo or ex vivo therapies. For those common types of viral vectors, I'll be discussing the three here, lentivirus, adenovirus, and adeno-associated virus. These viruses have different properties that make them good for treating different types of diseases once they've been turned into vectors. Lentivirus has an RNA genome, so it can deliver RNA into a cell that is then converted into DNA, which integrates into the host genome. This means it can make long-term modifications to dividing cells because that genetic information would pass down to daughter cells. This is usually used for ex vivo gene therapy, and it can deliver genes up to 10 KB. In this case, when we talk about viral vectors, the term KB stands for kilobase or 1,000 bases. So it's a measurement of how much genetic material can be fit into the viral capsid. Antiviruses are viruses that commonly cause colds in the wild, but once they're turned into vectors, they can deliver their therapeutic DNA into a cell. This DNA does not integrate into the genome, so it can only provide long-term correction in non-dividing cells. It's usually used for in vivo gene therapy. Adenoviruses tend to have a higher immunogenicity than other viruses like adeno-associated viruses, but this can be advantageous for them as they're frequently used to treat cancers. These have a very large carrying capacity and can hold up to 36,000 bases of genetic material, the DNA. For adeno-associated viruses or AAVs, these also deliver DNA, and they also do not integrate into the cellular genome. So again, they only can provide long-term correction in non-dividing cells. These are usually used for in vivo gene therapies, and they have lower immunogenicity than adenoviruses, but they have a very small carrying capacity with only up to 5,000 bases. Here, I'd like to give some caveats before we go on and say that this is a general overview, and there can be exceptions and nuances to how these vectors are used. For instance, some scientists have made lentiviruses that don't integrate. When we say adenoviruses and AAVs don't integrate, we mean it's because they don't have an active mechanism to do so. But patients who have received adenoviruses, uh, sorry, adeno-associated viruses during gene therapies have been shown to show that they can have small integration events at a very low level, 
And even though we say that AAV has low immunogenicity, people who receive AAV vectors do still show immune responses. And there are scientists working right now to make adenoviruses less immunogenic. So keep that in mind that when we broadly talk about gene therapies, there can be exceptions in different ways these vectors are used. Here I'd like to take a closer look at lentivirus as an ex vivo gene therapy vector. Because lenti can integrate its um, genome into the host cell, there is always a risk for cancer, but this risk can be reduced by removing the cells from a patient and infecting them in a dish. By delivering the virus outside the body to the cells that are directly being targeted, we can then modify these cells with a permanent change. Here in this example, we're removing blood from the patient and isolating T cells, which are an immune cell that can help target cancer. The lentivirus in this case is carrying a gene called a chimeric antigen receptor, which will then be inserted into the T cell's genome, thus making it a CAR T cell for a chimeric antigen receptor T cell. These are grown up in millions of cells in the lab, then they're infused back into the patient where they can now recognize and target the cancer cells. Here is a more in-depth approach of what's happening molecularly with the lentiviral vector. Here we can see that the vector is attaching to the outside of the cell membrane, where once attached, it can enter the cell and then release its viral RNA into the cytoplasm of the cell. The cytoplasm is everything that's outside of an organelle of the cell, like the nucleus. And here, there are viral proteins that were delivered with the vector that can then turn the RNA into DNA. And then this DNA is imported into the nucleus of the cell, where those thin viral proteins can integrate it into the host cell genome. Here, the instructions for the protein um, can be read and transcribed and then turn into a therapeutic protein that will have long-term effect because this DNA will be passed on to daughter cells when the cell divides. Instead of proteins, sometimes people can also um, encode the instructions for small RNA molecules that have the ability to regulate host protein. So there isn't always a therapeutic protein product, but there could also be an RNA product or other types of genetic um, changes. An example of a disease that's being used um, in gene therapies is sickle cell. Sickle cell is a disease that affects blood cells, which divide quite frequently. And this can lead um, us to choose a vector where we want to have a long-term therapeutic effect. So the lentivirus is a good choice because, the, again, the adenovirus and the AAV don't integrate and it won't be copied alongside the new cells. Also, in this case, the blood cells we're trying to affect are the stem cells, which live in the bone marrow of a patient and can be hard to target in vivo. So if we do an ex vivo approach by removing those cells, we can easier access them in a dish and expose them to the lentiviral vector. Once these um, cells have their permanent changes, they're infused back into the patient for a long-term effect. Here for adenoviral vectors, um, again, these are gene therapy vectors that can be infused directly into a patient or into a tissue. They are a common type of vector for treating cancer. And in this case, they're called oncolytic vectors because they can help destroy tumor cells and cause them to rupture. This can be done by either encoding a gene in the adenoviral vector that can help destroy the cancer cell or through a replication competent adenovirus. This is one of those exceptions when we talked about earlier about removing uh, replication genes from the virus. Here, the uh, adenovirus actually can replicate in tumor cells and this can help lead to a killing effect because of the nature of the virus. If you use this um, synergistically with a therapeutic transgene and also because the adenoviruses have a strong immune response, this is all working together to help target and kill these cancer cells. Here again is our closer molecular look at what the adenoviral vector is doing in a cell. Here we can see that the adenoviral vector is binding to a receptor where it's then internalized into the cell by hijacking its way through binding to that receptor. It traffics to outside the nucleus where it can inject its DNA, the therapeutic gene, into the nucleus of the cell where now the cell can read the instructions for the protein of the therapeutic gene. It's then created in the cell and in this case will help to lead to cell killing of the cancer cells. For an example of a type of um, adenoviral cancer therapy, a P53 expressing adenovirus has been tried. P53 is an important gene for preventing and killing cancer cells, and many cancer cells have a mutated P53 gene. This P53 can recognize when something is going wrong in a cell, and so many cancer cells have them mutated to allow them to continue to replicate. Adenoviruses can be modified by scientists to express the P53 gene, and when they're infused into the patient, this will be expressed and help them target um, and kill the cancer cells. And again, because they express it, um, have a hot, strong immune response, then you have a synergistic effect for killing the cancer. Finally, 
We'll move on to adeno associated vectors that are commonly used for in vivo gene therapy. There are two approved therapies in the United States, Luxterna for Lieber congenital amaurosis and Zolgensma for spinal muscular atrophy. This SMA treatments were a topic of a previous Lunch and Learn, and so I encourage you to go back and watch the Lunch and Learn for these treatments if you haven't done so already. AAVs can be administered directly to the patient, um, either through infusing the blood or directly into a tissue. And again, they have a small carrying, carrying capacity. AV vectors in the cell um, are entered through, again, receptor binding, much like adenovirus. They can bind the receptor, which is then internalized into an endosome. And this is a trafficking molecule that allows the vector to then enter into the nucleus where the capsid falls apart in a process called uncoding, which releases the viral single-stranded DNA. Here, the single-stranded DNA is turned into a circular episome, and this is the stable portion of the therapeutic um, gene that will uh, lead to long-term expression in non-dividing cells. From here, the cell can read the instructions, either they could be for a protein or for a therapeutic RNA that can regulate protein expression. As an example, um, Luxterna was the first AAV therapy approved for um, in the United States, and it treats Leber's congenital amaurosis, which is a disease that causes childhood blindness. In LCA, the RPE65 gene is mutated, and the encoded protein can't function properly. So in the lab, the AAV vectors are um, modified so they can deliver a functional copy of the RPE65 to the cells that need it. Here, AAV is a good choice because it's less immunogenic than adenovirus, and we certainly wouldn't want something immunogenic in the eye causing inflammation. And because we can target directly the cells that need the therapy the most, um, it's, it's a good choice for an in, uh, like an in-tissue injection. And because the cells don't divide, it'll lead to the long-term expression. I'd also like to point out here a difference between a gene supplementation approach or a gene editing approach. In this case, the cells already have two copies of RP65 that don't function, and we're adding a third with the AAV. But a gene editing approach would try to modify the change, um, the original RPE65 genes that are already present instead of adding in a new gene. One of the other advantages for AAV as a um, delivery vector is that there are many different naturally occurring serotypes of AAV. A serotype is a group of viruses that all have a common immune recognition profile that are composed of antigens. These different serotypes can target different cell types uh, with more efficiency. So some AAVs might be better at targeting the lung or the skeletal muscle. And this is advantageous when it comes to making gene therapy vectors because we have a wide variety of serotypes to choose from. As an example of um, serotypes in everyday life now, some scientists are deciding that the new SARS-CoV-2 variant, Omicron, might actually be considered a new serotype. So even though it's the same SARS-CoV-2 virus as the one that started the pandemic, because people who have been exposed to the original virus can still be infected by Omicron, it implies it has different antigenic groups. And thus, even though they are still the same virus, they would be considered a different serotype. It's the same with these AAVs. They're all still AAV, but because you might have been exposed to an AAV as a child, you would then develop an immune response to that. But that immune response might not prevent you from getting reinfected with a different AAV serotype later on. This is important when it comes to gene therapy, because if someone was exposed to AAV2 and had an immune response to it, that might make their therapy ineffective if they were given an AAV2 vector. But they might be eligible for an AV gene therapy from a different serotype they don't already have an immune response to. Beyond the naturally occurring serotypes, AV capsids can be modified by scientists to gain new properties and target different tissues or even detarget tissues. So, right now, many scientists are trying to modify AVs to prevent them from going to the liver. Because if you're not treating an, a disease that is in the liver, then having the AV go to the liver might make your therapy less effective, and many AAVs do preferentially target the liver. There are uh, three common strategies for modifying AAVs in the lab, and this can be through causing mutations, capsid shuffling, or putting in insertions. When we're making mutations, these are targeted point mutations um, in the genes that encode the capsid proteins for the virus. And by adding these mutations, we can give them new properties where they might target different tissues. In capsid shuffling, you can take the genes encoding the capsid proteins of many different wild type naturally occurring serotypes and kind of cut them and paste them back together in different ways to create no new proteins for the capsid. And again, this will give it a different profile for which tissues it might target. 
we can also do insertions. And here, we're adding in new DNA into the capsid sequence, putting in a novel function. And this is often done in flexible regions of the capsid called the variable loops. And these peptides can then target different tissues uh, within the body. So in summary, I'd like to remind everyone that the big challenge for gene therapy is delivering therapeutic genes into cells. But viruses have been highly evolved to deliver genetic materials into cells over the millions of years they've been infecting us. These viruses can be modified by scientists to create safe delivery vehicles called vectors. Different viruses can be modified to target different um, cells and different diseases. Lentivirus integrates into patients' genomes, so it's good for ex vivo uh, dividing cells. Adenovirus is not integrating. It's a bit immunogenic, but it's good for immune stimulation and is frequently used to target cancer. AAV is not integrating and not very immunogenic and good for long-term gene delivery in non-dividing cells. Also, these viruses can be further modified to target specific cell, type, cell types through capsid engineering. So I'd like to thank the society again and encourage everyone to visit our patient education site at patienteducationasuct.org and also say that um, almost all of the images for this presentation were made in BioRender. Thank you, and I hope this answered some of your questions about viral vectors, and I'm happy to answer them further on later in the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the Patient Education Program for inviting me to speak today about safety on viral vectors. Uh, my name is Carmen Onsu, and I'm an investigator at um, CIMA University of Navarra in Spain. So as an overview, I'm going to review some concepts that my colleague L'Oreal early has explained very well before, just for the sake of uh, guiding you through the topic of the talk, which is safety. I will discuss the safety concerns associated to viral vectors and the solutions that have been are being evaluated right now. Then I will um, summarize a little bit the safety evaluation process during preclinical and clinical studies. And I will conclude discussing a little bit the current challenges on viral vector safety and the ongoing solutions from both uh, scientists and clinicians. As a reminder, this is an educational session, so I'm going to use very simple terms and uh, lay language so all the audience can understand what I'm talking about. So um, going back to review the concepts, this is a slide uh, summarizing what in vivo gene therapy looks like and what ex vivo gene therapy looks like. So on top, you have in vivo gene therapy. Uh, here we have um, when we want to um, generate gene augmentation or correct a gene that has that is affected in a patient, we can use different kind of vehicles to bring this gene to the target cell. So those vehicles can be non-viral in the case of lipid nanoparticles here, or viral vectors, which are the most efficient vehicles in targeting uh, the nucleus of the cells right now. And then these vehicles are delivered directly into the patient. So that's in vivo gene therapy, uh, which is different to the ex vivo approach where cells from the patient, usually uh, blood stem cells, are taken from the patient out and uh, modified in the lab by introducing, well, by transducing them with the viral vector that will have that genetic information that is going to modify either. Um, the immune system cell in the case of cell immunotherapy, as you can see here in the CAR T cell example, or that is going to introduce the um, affected gene in the case of uh, genetic disease using a antiviral vector that will integrate the genetic information into the host cell genome. So then what is introduced into the patient are the cells that have been modified. So with that, I will uh, remind you about the main viral vectors that I'm going to speak about today. So the first one is adeno-associated viral vector, or AV. Um, as a reminder, these are non-integrative viral vectors, which means that the genetic information that they deliver to the cell is going to be separate from the host genome. They're non-pathogenic, which means that they, do not, they don't cause disease. And therefore, they're the main um, preferred 
uh, vehicles to deliver genetic information in people. I will talk a little bit about adenoviruses, which are uh, viral vectors that have higher capacity compared to AEDs. They, on the other hand, they uh, trigger an acute inflammatory response, and therefore they uh, prefer to be used in, as oncolytic vectors for cancer gene therapy. And third, I will talk about lentiviral vectors, which uh, their main feature is that they're integrative, that uh, it means that the genetic information that they deliver is going to integrate into the host genome. And therefore, they're used for ex vivo gene therapy because you want to keep that the genetic information in the stem cell that is going to divide throughout. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump into the safety concerns associated to viral vectors and the solutions that have been uh, proposed and are being used. First, with some historical clinical data. So for ex vivo gene therapy, the first clinical trials happened in the late 90s in France and UK, and they were targeting a severe combined immunodeficiency where the interleukin-2 receptor gamma gene is affected in blood cells. Um, and for correcting and treating this disease, the, the vector that was used were that were used were based in gamma retroviruses. And it was encoding the IL2RG gene. Um, and then patient blood cells, as I explained before, were taken out of the patient, transduced with these vectors to uh, supply the missing gene. And then um, after treatment, patients saw a pretty good genetic correction. They restored the patient's general health and enabled them to lead to you know, normal life with long-lasting beneficial effects. And the follow-up for uh, these studies was uh, 13 years, as you can see here. Uh, but unfortunately, from a total of 20 patients that were dosed um, for developed T cell leukemia, two to five years after their gene therapy. And in all cases, uh, this adverse event was the result of insertional mutagenesis. So, uh, scientists and clinicians went back to the vents uh, for solutions and especially to study uh, extensively why, how uh, insertional mutagenesis was happening and to track where these integrations were happening in the, in the genome. Also, there was a switch from uh, gamma retroviruses to lentiviral vectors that uh, were proven to be safer, uh, especially the self-inactivating form, and also modified the capsids were used to increase safety. And in addition, there's been a lot of work trying to optimize the whole ex vivo process from uh, when the cells are taken out of the patient to the blood reconstitution step. And as a result, starting as I mentioned in the Early 2000s, there was, uh, as an example, the ex vivo gene therapy for uh, adenosine uh, deaminase, adenine deaminase, sorry, uh, deficiency. That is also another se severe immunodeficiency affecting kids. And in this case, a lentiviral vector was used. And after many, many years, 25 to 30 years of work, um, the drug was approved by the European Union in 2016, which is uh, the drug is Estrin Velis, uh, for treating these patients. And uh, after this, there was also the approval of another ex vivo gene therapy for beta thalassemia. And on the other hand, on the cancer uh, ex vivo cell therapy, there's been seven um, ex vivo gene therapies for especially or mostly CAR T cells for cancer approved by the FDA which means that, you know, some of these problems were solved and follow up and, and successfully translated to the clinic. On the in vivo gene therapy side, the first clinical trial happened as well in the late 90s. In this case, it was for ornithin transcarbamylase deficiency, which is a liver metabolic disease. And the vector chosen for therapy was an adenoviral vector. In this case, patients were dosed um, Patients, those were all adults, and they, uh, from the beginning, they saw transient adverse effects that were mostly um, look like flu like symptoms and uh, liver toxicity and thrombocytopenia. Um, but these uh, effects were transient, but as the doses were 
increase in the clinical trial and escalated. The second patients of the highest dose uh, had a fulminant acute inflammatory response that unfortunately, unfortunately led to, to death in a few days. And the reason and the explanation that was associated to such an acute immune response was the adenoviral vector capsid. So this was uh, really sad and unfortunate for the patient, his family, but for the whole uh, gene therapy community in general and, and many, many uh, teams were focusing in, in trying to, or research group in trying to uh, fix this problem. And especially what happened is that adenoviral vectors were uh, moved to the cancer gene therapy field and uh, then associated vectors that were not immunogenic were used for in vivo gene therapy. So a few years later, um, the first uh, clinical trial using an AV vector uh, started and the results were published in 2006. This uh, pioneer work was led by Kathy High and Mark Kay and was targeting hemophilia B, which is a, a deficiency in clotting factor nine. So the AV that was delivered to the patients was encoding uh, the factor nine gene. So here they were able to show a successful transduction of the liver, which is the, the target tissue. And then uh, they also were able to show safety of the therapy, but however, they face some limitations also imposed by the host immune system. So the first um, lesson that was learned from this clinical trial was that uh, ABs also trigger an immune response. It's not as, an, as acute as uh, adenoviral vectors do, but it happens. And it happens in humans um, in a different way that um, was, pre was detected in preclinical models in animals. So um, as an example, you can see here in this graph, uh, this is after infusion or dosing of the therapy to one patient, the activity of factor nine, which is the missing uh, or affected gene in these patients increased after two weeks and they saw sustained expression of factor nine for a couple of weeks. However, after that expression dropped uh, for several weeks until below the limit of detection. And this drop in expression was overlapping with an increase in transaminases, liver transaminases here in green and blue. That uh, meant that there was uh, um, some sort of liver toxicity. And, and again, this was not predicted in, in the animal models. So uh, second, another problem that was observed was that uh, patients presented, some patients presented pre-existing antibodies that were blocking the AV vectors that were used to deliver the therapeutic transient to the cells. And that pre-existing immunity was blocking 100% successful liver transduction. So it was learned that if, if there's pre-existing immunity, then uh, liver transduction is hampered. So based on these results from that uh, very first AV clinical trial, uh, as I mentioned before, there was uh, another round of going back to events to understanding better how uh, AV vectors transduce the cell and most importantly, how the immune system interact with these particles and the difference between the preclinical models and the patients in order to reduce vector immunogenicity. In addition, it, it has been studied extensively how to use corticosteroids and immunosuppression to control those immune responses and um, different strategies to eliminate or block those anti-AV antibodies that I mentioned before that can hamper uh, successful gene therapy. In addition, as I said, uh, related to adenoviral vectors, now they're mostly used in cancer immun uh, immunotherapy, that is um, cancer gene therapy, sorry, that uh, is actually a desirable feature to uh, trigger an acute immune response. So as an example on how all that work in the background that scientists perform uh, can lead to successful clinical results, there's the um, example of the hemophilia B clinical trial led by a similar team that uh, 
led the first one, but this is on more than 10 years later in 2017, where the vector was optimized. So a new capsid was used, a new transient that led to higher levels of uh, protein expression was uh, used as well. As I mentioned, corticosteroids to control that uh, immune response and then more stringent patient selection uh, with patients that did not have neutralizing antibodies. And with this, uh, you can see here the activity of factor nine after dosing of those patients uh, was uh, at least three times higher in most of the patients dose and was sustained for at least one year uh, of follow-up that happened during this trial, which are very uh, good news for the field. In addition, I would like to mention that um, during the past years, there's two AV clinical trial, um, clinical, two AV therapies, sorry, that have been approved by the FDA for treating uh, genetic diseases. So switching gears towards safety evaluation during preclinical and clinical studies, as you can see here, uh, based on FDA guidelines and recommendations, we have a number of things that we need to check in preclinical studies before moving into a clinical trial for a specific gene therapy. First of all, uh, looking into vector potency, which means how efficient is that drug into, in doing its job, which is, um, for example, can be uh, supplementing uh, um, an affected gene or silencing a gene that has a, a gain of function um, or a combination of both. So we look into all of that. We look into the quality of the PrEP, the formulation, um, which is something that uh, patient, patients ask a lot, especially now with uh, COVID vaccines, what's on what is the those particles suspended and dosed into the patients, the purity of that, the integrity of each particle, and the homogeneity from PrEP to PrEP and, and other parameters. And then, of course, we look into vector-related toxicity by performing those escalation studies where many other parameters are being analyzed. And I summarize some here, but it really depends on uh, what uh, the therapy is, and uh, routes of administration of target um, and biodistribution, for example. And, and of course, the most appropriate model and controls are being used in every case. And all this information is summarized and included in what is called an investigational new drug application that is submitted to the FDA before uh, a clinical trial is approved to start. In addition, on the clinical studies and uh, in that very same application for to the FDA for a new investigational drug, uh, you have to include the, include the clinical trial design. And in the case of gene therapies, uh, usually phase one and phase two are combined because the low number of patients that can be enrolled in the clinical trial. As you may be familiar with, phase one uh, primary objective is safety. And uh, this is the main goal to assess during, during the trial. And there's many ways to assess that. Uh, in addition to the drug safety, there's uh, the feasibility that is also assessed by, you know, if there's another procedure, there's a new device that is being used, how the product is handling and, and combinations thereof. And also uh, what is evaluated during the, in the, design proposal is the dose selection based on the preclinical data that goes in the same packets. And uh, something that happens um, most of the times is that the dosing is staggered from one patient to the next one to ensure safe intervals between subjects. And, and then it always starts from the lowest dose to the highest. Then a little bit of on patient eligibility, there's always a risk benefit assessment and eligibility has to be justified for its, its trial. And that includes the severity of the disease and, uh, for example, results interpretation. Uh, in addition, there is a careful consideration of uh, the control or including control groups, uh, yes or no, how, and if the study is blinded or not, and if there's the lack of other treatment options. And uh, for example, mentioning in the case of uh, in vivo gene therapies with AV, is very important, as I mentioned before, 
to analyze the presence and absence of neutralizing antibodies because that can block completely uh, the successful transduction of the target tissue. And uh, in the case of ex vivo gene therapies, the, the possibility of having an HLA compatible donor. So if patients are eligible for cell therapy only, uh, usually they're not eligible for a uh, gene and cell therapy combination. So of course, all this uh, is being informed to the patient and the patient has to sign an informed consent. It's reviewed by the Institutional Review Board and the FDA, and there's always a special considerations for pediatric patients. And again, I'm talking about like very general concepts and every for every drug, there's uh, very specific um, guidelines. So then during the clinical trial, um, I mean, previous to the clinical trial, there's been a number of standard operating procedures that have been put in place and that need to be followed. Um, all the operators are trained, all the clinicians, participants have a specific training for that uh, particular trial. And the most uh, important and key aspect here is compliance to ensure the safety of the patients. Again, everything is very well documented. There is careful recording of procedures or should be very well documented and, and variations from SOPs. How safety is monitored during the clinical trial. So there's clinical and physical examinations plus the specific examinations for the condition that is being examined or investigated. Um, and, and clinicians are also on the lookout for anticipated safety concerns. So for example, if there's um, if there's not a concern associated for that particular uh, condition, but has been observed in previous uh, gene therapy clinical trials, uh, it will be a, that will be an anticipated safety concern. So um, more on that, there's uh, as in preclinical studies, there's uh, the monitoring of all, especially the persistence of the product and the activity. So uh, distribution, setting, uh, duration of the activity is monitored in patients as well. And after dosing, there's the follow-up for at least a year for most gene therapies, and it can be up to 15 years for ex vivo gene therapies due to the risk of insertion and mutagenesis. And then in the fortunate uh, situation where there's a serious adverse event, depending on the presence or the frequency, the study can be halted. It has happened in the past, and I will touch based on that uh, uh, soon. And that can lead to the suspension of the enrollment and investigation to, again, ensure the safety of the patients. So now, uh, a little bit on the current challenges on viral vector safety. Uh, last year, it was uh, reported that with the string release drug, there was one case of uh, T cell leukemia that is being investigated right now. And on the in vivo gene therapy side, there's been a number of severe adverse events that had happened uh, in several clinical trials that uh, happens as well with the Solgensma drug that has been approved. And most of them are hepatotoxicity and thrombocytopenia, which is a drop in the platelet count. And they're uh, associated with high AV doses. So again, it's one of those times where the scientific community, the regulatory agencies are and clinicians are coming together to figure out what's going on and how we can make safer therapies for the patients. And that's uh, currently being evaluated and, and how we can prevent and stop this uh, of happening. So in summary, um, on the in vivo gene therapy, to remind everyone that ABs are the most used uh, gene delivery vehicles to the cell nucleus, and there's two AB FDAs, FDA approved gene therapies. The current safety challenges are liver toxicity and the drop of platelet counts uh, associated with high AB doses. And the ongoing research work to try to uh, Prevent this is focusing on optimization of the manufacturing process, as well as the optimization of AV vector components in order to reduce the doses for ensuring safety. 
In addition, uh, there's been um, reported, it has been reported genotoxicity in the preclinical site and to prevent that from happening in clinical trials, there's also uh, the study of the integration pattern as it has been done for ex vivo gene therapy in the past. And now moving into ex vivo gene therapy, to summarize, uh, lentiviral vectors are the most used vectors for uh, ex vivo. There's seven FDA approved and two AMA approved therapies in this case, and the main current safety challenge is insertion and mutagenesis. So the ongoing research work is uh, focused on directing integration to safe genomic locations and the optimization of the whole ex vivo process from the transduction to the transfer to the patient. And with this, I would like to thank uh, again the ESCCT Patient Education Program, especially to Ali Kujoski, who has been coordinating this wonderful Lunch and Learn series uh, to uh, put together and closer uh, scientists and patients and the community. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, Thank you to both Dr. Early and uh, Dr. Unju for such wonderful and informative presentations. And uh, now we are entering the Q&A, the moderated Q&A portion of, of today's Lunch and Learn. So please, if you do have any questions, go ahead and throw them into the Q&A or chat box. And uh, we can start with a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, one being, if the target cell is dividing, can a patient be retreated with an AAV vector? And I'll go ahead and let either of you uh, answer that. I can start. Um, so when it comes to dividing versus non-dividing, that is not going to affect whether the retreatment can happen or not. That's going to be primarily done by the initial immune response. And so unfortunately, the question will have to be answered with a, it depends because of all the nuances in, in a lot of these. But the idea being that when you receive of viral vectors of gene therapy, your body will see that as a regular virus and, and mount an immune response that consists of antibodies and perhaps T cells that might destroy infected cells. And so when we're really thinking about retreatment, um, the first barrier is thinking about antibodies. And you can try to get around that with, again, a different serotype, but you couldn't use the same treatment a second time unless there was a way to prevent your body from developing that immune response. And there are people actively looking at ways to do this with um, immune suppression or drugs that might be able to prevent that immune response. There are also other um, scientists looking at ways to get bypass an already existing immune response to make those therapies more available for people. Uh, but currently it would depend a lot on the situation, but if you had a, a strong immune response the first time to a treatment, it, you couldn't get the same dose again and feel free to jump in um, Carmen if you <laughs> know of any other um, thoughts on that so. I think you explain it briefly okay I think for the second one um, it would depend a lot again so we are still studying how long term these therapies can be and certainly and we've seen in trials um, and extensions of that over 10 years of therapeutic expression of the gene. And so potentially it's a very long, you could have a very long-term therapy, but uh, a concern really is that how long does that therapy last? And we just don't know yet. And that's in part because you're studying these things for decades and decades. And so it just takes a long time to get those answers. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, just to repeat the, that second question, it was if the transgene is inducible, um, uh, and, and the target cells non-dividing, how long will that vector be responsive? Uh, wonderful, thank you, Dr. Early. And it looks like we do have a couple more questions coming in. Uh, the second being what, or I'm sorry, in a condition like our genino-succinic aciduria, in which multiple targets, liver slash brain might be required, is AAV gene therapy still a viable choice? I can take that one. So basically when there's uh, multiple targets, you can still use AAV vector as a, uh, vehicle for delivering the gene, what it happens is that usually you use a promoter and a promoter is the part of the vector that is going to start the expression of the gene that is going to uh, work in every cell type independently of the tissue. And second, you do a systemic uh, dosing. So 
you uh, dose it in the bloodstream so it can get to any tissue in, in your body. And then that promoter is going to start the expression of the gene in every cell type where the vector has reads and, and get. I'll also say that I've seen some papers in preclinical work with animals where people are trying, you can target the brain directly and then also do systemic to try to get really the whole body. Um, and so that might be something that could make its way to the clinic someday, but I'm not currently aware of that being used, but that doesn't mean it isn't out there. Um, and certainly, hopefully you have a doctor who's um, able to look through some clinical trials and see what types of routes are being used um, in that kind of disease setting. Wonderful. And let's see, so we have another question, a couple coming in. Uh, what are the pros and cons of non-viral gene therapies that are coming up compared to viral vector-based therapies? Maybe you can each share your favorite pros and cons of uh, each of those uh, different delivery vehicles. Um, yes, yeah, sir. So basically non-viral vectors uh, for specific tissues are very good in, in targeting them. So for example, uh, lipid nanoparticles that are the most used right now at very because they have been very, very successful reaching out uh, and targeting the liver, for example. The caveat of that is that uh, they're very good treating those tissues, but they stay in the cytoplasm of the cell. And if you remember from uh, Laurie's talk, that's the, the part um, outside the nucleus where you wanna, where you want to read to deliver the genetic information. If you do the mRNA that you may be familiar with that concept, which is the second step of expression of your gene, then you're fine being in the cytoplasm, but sometimes you just need to deliver the DNA part and reach to the nucleus. And for that, viral vectors are the most efficient right now as of today. I don't know, L'Oreal, if you wanna add uh, something else to that. I would absolutely agree that I think the main difference really is that ability to target the nucleus, which is where you're gonna have kind of a, a long-term stable expression of delivered DNA. And so I know there are a lot of active research in trying to find ways to get um, non-viral based methods to get into the nucleus, but it's really challenging because again, your, your cells are, have very strong defenses try to make sure that foreign DNA doesn't get into the nucleus. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of research in hoping that those viral vector, non-viral vector deliveries will be able to meet that challenge someday. But right now, just the ability to get to the nucleus is really where um, viral vectors are kind of shining out. All right, great. So let's see, we have probably time for, we say we'll have quite a bit of time. Uh, so the next question is, how many people treated with AAV gene therapies have experienced the various safety issues that you mentioned compared to the overall number of people treated with these therapies? So that's a, that's a good question. And I would say it's a low number of people uh, compared to all the people that have been dosed. And usually, you know, it happens with, again, as I said, high doses. So there's many people who have been treated with lower doses who don't, uh, they have transient mild effects and then they're perfectly fine. So they don't feel that or they don't experience that acute liver toxicity, for example. So that's why there's a lot of research ongoing right now trying to optimize uh, the vectors in order to decrease those doses and make them as safe as the low doses are right now. Yeah, and I would agree. It seems like really the high dosing is where we start to see those effects. And it also could depend a lot on the patient's pre-existing conditions. So if they have a disease that affects their liver already, then they might be more susceptible to some of these effects. Uh, and so it could depend a lot on the disease setting as well. Awesome, thank you both for that. So let's see, the next question is, what is currently, or what are current methods to assess uh, for lentivirus vector integration sites? It is, uh, is it not always required unless you are employing a new vector? So, Usually what it, um, is a sequencing method. So you go and sequence where based on the sequence of the lentiviral vector that is known, where that has been integrated into the genome looking the surroundings of it. And uh, that's how scientists know where exactly has that um, lentiviral gene landed. And what was the second part of the question, sorry? 
Sure. So the second part of the question was, is it not uh, always required unless you are employing a new vector? And I guess that is in regard to uh, determining that integration site. I, I think to... it's it's something I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but it's something that uh, um, investigators always and clinicians always look at because because it's done ex vivo, so you have the opportunity to look at the cells before they're uh, tra uh, transplanted back into the patient. So I think that's something that is looked at before. The problem is that once the cells are into the patient, they're gonna continue proliferating. And that's why like uh, there's this long-term follow-up for ex vivo gene therapies to, to control. And, and there's no way to control that once the transplantation has happened. So even though there's samples before, there's this long-term follow-up uh, of the patients to, to keep on uh, looking in these kind of events. Wonderful. So the last two questions before I think we'll need to wrap up are, or one is, have you seen insertional mutagenesis with patients treated in vivo with AAV vectors? And I think this is a quite a topical question uh, to discuss. Uh, I guess I'll start. Yeah. So there are um, published works showing that, um, so integration sites of AAV vectors. And so we know it happens. There haven't been any um, pathological consequences of that so far seen, although it's being very closely monitored by clinicians, study groups, and the FDA. The concern is that in, in some in vivo models, people have seen insertional mutagenesis that leads to cancer, but that was in, it's in a specific mouse model at a specific age of the mouse. And so whether that relates to humans is still a question mark that's being very actively investigated. I would also, I know that ASGCT this year at our annual meeting, there's going to be a um, a whole pre-session workshop uh, on this topic. And so if people are planning on attending the meeting either in person or maybe it's, I don't know if it's offered virtually for this particular workshop, but that might be something of interest. Um, but so far no one's seen any adverse effects, but that, you know, it's still very much being monitored. Well, awesome. And yeah, I think we'll wrap up with this last question before handing it back off to Ali. And, and that is, can you touch briefly on in vivo exosome-based treatment versus AAV? I am a little unclear on the question. I'm thinking it might be the exosome-based AAV treatments, which in this case, the AAV is collected. It's so when the AAV, when you're processing, when you're making AAV, um, you can collect just exosomes from your cells and those can contain AAV in them. Um, and then you can use that as almost like a, a membrane around your AAV particles as part of the treatment. And I'm not real familiar with some of the differences between that and AAV because it's a bit more of a specialty thing. Um, but the, the thought is that it might protect the capsids a bit from an immune response. Uh, but again, it's, uh, I don't know if that's exactly what the, the question was referring to. And if they would like to type back in and, and ask again. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I'm just going to speculate here because this isn't really where I've studied, but my guess would be it might help protect against the immune response, but you wouldn't be able to target it the same way you would if you had an exposed capsid because you're not modifying that exosome the same way. And I know that they're being looked at preclinically for um, in, in small spaces, like in the inner ear. And so that might be where there's a lot of focus on that. Uh, sorry, I'm not more helpful with that particular question, but uh, hopefully that's a little helpful. There's yeah, the only in that chat too. Hmm? Oh, the only additional thing is that it's been shown also for eye targeting mm -hmm. that is uh, more efficient sometimes transducing depending on the target with uh, the AV exosome combination. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if the question was on exosomes, like non-viral. Um, it seems like it was for the AAB okay. specific from the Q&A. Um, yeah, so I've seen it being used preclinically in, in areas kind of like small spaces, like the ear and the eye, as opposed yes. to something that was systemic. Uh, but maybe that'll change in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's nothing in the clinic, as far as I know. Uh, no, I'm not aware either. And well, we awesome. Do we have time oh, for the one last question in the chat? Oh, in the chat, let's see. Yeah. Sure, yeah, so, okay, let's see. Hmm. Tony Alter says several groups have shown impressive CNS distribution of transgenes after modified AAV 
delivered intravenously in primate models. How close is this method uh, to, I guess, being used in human trials? It would go through the same process as any other vector. So you would have to have a robust preclinical model. You would then have to you know, do all the things you would do for a clinic. But there are, at this point in time, modified, like lab modified AVs being put into these trials. And so um, I don't know the timing on these things. We always say generally it's like eight to 10 years before something gets really into the clinic, but I would still say years away. Uh, but it's, yeah, I remember that paper and it, it is very impressive in, in the paper for that distribution. So I think it's pretty exciting right now to see how capsids are being modified and we're getting really interesting biodistribution profiles. It's pretty, um, it's fun to see the field evolve so quickly. Awesome. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up our moderated Q&A session. And I will uh, thank you all for joining us today. And of course, a special thanks to uh, Dr. Early and Dr. Unzu. And I'll uh, throw it back to Ali for a few uh, comments at the end here. Yes, thank you for everyone who joined today for the great questions to our presenters and moderator. Um, I hope everyone found value in this session. Um, it'll be posted on our patient education website and sent out to you via email um, if you had registered. Uh, so it will be available for recording. Um, if you found this useful, uh, please feel free to share this information with others. Um, and then also as you leave the Zoom session today, if you can just take a moment to provide your feedback in the short survey, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, and consider joining us. Um, registration is now open for the next month's Lunch and Learn. Um, that is on April 28th. It'll focus on manufacturing and how AAV vectors are made. We often hear that gene therapies are complex and require a lot of time and money to make, but what does that really mean? Uh, tune in to hear experts in the field answer this question. Uh, they'll walk through the manufacturing process, the importance of quality control, the current state of manufacturing capacity and timelines, um, and they'll also address how critical advanced planning is for future success from a clinical and regulatory perspective. Um, also how costly changes can be prevented. Um, I think it'll be a really great talk uh, and we hope that you'll join us. Um, thanks for tuning in today and have a wonderful rest of your week.